Discover the best kept secrets from the leading entrepreneurs across the globe. Learn from the greatest minds in business with the MyCoder podcast. Here's your host, Sam Payne. Hello and welcome to the MyCoder podcast. My name is Sam Payne and it is a pleasure to be bringing you today's show. Now, If you're sitting there thinking, I want to write a book, or you know you've got a ton of value that you are ready to give, but you just don't know how to do it, then this is the podcast for you. Today's guest is Robert Duff from Duff the Psych, and Robert has wrote two best-selling books on Amazon. He has got a podcast, and he's also a psychiatrist as a full-time occupation as well. Now, Rob has done this as a sideline project. He has set up a successful business as a sideline, as well as being a psychiatrist full time. And he also went through the process of writing his full book, uh, his first book, when going through his exams in university or college. Okay, so even though he had so much on his plate with with regards to studying, learning, writing he can still write a book in his spare time that still sells consistently month after month after month across many different formats, being audio, Kindle, or paperback. So this one, guys, is an incredible interview, and I got a lot from this one because Robert is not only a really... I mean, he's one of the most genuine guys I've interviewed. He truly is out there to help people. But second to that... He is just so knowledgeable when it comes to what it takes to write a book and how to put your book together and how to get it out there to the world. So I'm not going to go on any longer, guys, in this intro. We're going to get straight into this one. This is the MyCoder podcast with Robert Duff from Duff the Psych. What's up, everybody? Sam Payne here, and welcome to the MyCoder podcast. Now, today's guest is Robert Duff from Duff the Psych. Robert, how are we doing today? Doing great, Sam. It's uh, it's 10 p.m. over here in uh, California, USA. So this is uh, one of my last things for the night, and I'm happy to be spending that time with you. Nice. Well, thank you for spending the time with us because I've been checking your stuff out, and, I, and I've listened to a, a lot of your interviews and seen your books, and I think you're going to have a ton of knowledge that's just going to help our listeners out because a lot of them are looking into the self-publishing route of their books. And just to enlighten them on how they can do it. So I'm excited to see what comes of this one. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get into the bones of this interview, though, could you just please go into a little bit more detail about who you are, what it is you do, and the work you're doing at the minute? Sure. Um, Okay, so the backstory, basically, currently I'm an early career psychologist. And what that means is um, last year I got my doctorate in psychology And at least in the U.S., there's a lot of hoops to jump through to become a licensed psychologist where you can actually practice independently. And so I'm kind of in the thick of that right now. And typically, that's not a very fun time for early career psychologists. There's a lot of money that goes into it, into getting licensed. There's a lot of kind of loose ends to pick up after school and stuff like that. Um, But I kind of made a decision um, randomly one day that I would like to not be poor throughout this whole process. <laughs> and the way that I did that is by writing a series of self-help books. So I started with one and I've written the second one since then. And the idea behind them is basically self-help for people that normally hate self-help books. Mm. So uh, part of my French, but the, uh, the title of my first book is called Hardcore Self-Help, Fuck Anxiety. And the second one is a similar title, but it's a fuck depression. And uh, it came up, you know, basically I- I've always been a normal sort of dude but I've been in this academic world and it bugs me when things get overly bloated, overly complicated. So I wrote this book in the way that I like to talk and the way that I like to understand things, which is simple, straightforward, no BS, funny, if possible, you know, to kind of help people laugh a little bit while they're struggling through these things. Um, and so, yeah, I, I started with this, this first book and I really wrote the thing in probably a few weeks because it was published the next month on Kindle. And then from there, I went through doing a bunch of different formats. And since then, it's, it's kind of blown up. That's, that's a big part of what I do now. I have a podcast that's an extension of that. And uh, here I am. <laughs> that's awesome. And I think what's really interesting about your story, actually, is the fact that you're pursuing another career that isn't traditionally so entrepreneurial. But on the sideline, you've got this, this great business that's generating revenue for you. And it, it must have been hard, though, going through that period where you were going to get your, your degree as, as a psychologist, as a psychologist mm-hmm. and, then, and then having to find the time and energy 
to focus on your books and, and setting up this sideline business. So, I mean, how was that for you? You know, you know, what's interesting is the hard part wasn't finding time to, to write the book. It was, it was hard to stop myself from blowing everything else off because this was so much more interesting and so much more exciting for me, (laughs) you know? So when, especially this first book, you know, in, in, I need to put in perspective. My first book is actually very short. It's, um, the print version is only 70 something pages and my second book is twice that long, but, um, so it's compact. It's really kind of lean and mean, but the first probably three, four chapters like flew out of me in a day. So that was a big chunk of it already. And it's a 10 chapter book. So I was able to kind of just squeeze the time in here and there and everywhere. Um, but yeah, like I said, the harder part was just not blowing everything else off to do this more exciting thing. At that time I was a, um, doing my pre doctoral internship at a, a large healthcare organization. And so I had a, basically a standard eight to five job and I was uh, day in, day out, just seeing clients for all kinds of different things psychologically related, you know, throughout the entire day. And it's very easy to get burnt out in that sort of situation. And so this was like a breath of fresh air where I could affect people on a, a larger scale even and do it in a way that was a lot less stuffy. Yeah. And I mean, it, it must have been quite difficult because I know that it, especially when I get excited about things, they can easily take <laughs> over and... <laughs> I yeah. tend to push everything else to the sideline. I mean, was there ever a temptation for you to go, do you know what? I think there's something in this and I'm going to I'm going to leave this psychology stuff alone. I'm going to leave my degree alone and and, and flip to become an entrepreneur. No, th- th- I don't I don't think that temptation was there because I mean, I've put in so many years into this already. There's <laughs> yeah, no way yeah. in hell, you know, and I yeah. still I'm very passionate about the, you know, individual clinical work that I do. That's that's the heart of this. But um I, I, it just kind of opened my eyes because a lot of people fall into this trap where they have to see so many different patients or clients, uh, as you may call them, uh, to put food on the table. And so people get caught in this, I, I call it the private practice trap, where all they're doing is seeing people day in, day out, like one after the other, bam, 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 only just to make a living, right? And this allows me to actually be more selective and more uh, relaxed with the clinical work, which I'm passionate about. I'm not doing it as a means to an end. I'm doing it because I enjoy it and I care about it. Yeah. I mean, and that makes complete sense when you say it like that. And, but I mean, writing a book, you, you make it sound so beautifully <laughs> simple. You really do. Sure. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, well, I'm going to write a book today. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's simple when you get a PhD in the subject, right? You know, I mean, I, we can't, we can't neglect the fact that I, I spent, you know, 21 years in school up to the point that I wrote that book, you know? Yeah. So it, 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 it was an easy subject for me to write about because these books are essentially my voice and they, you know, the second book, it took a lot more effort. That was a different process, um, than the first one, but you know, it, it wasn't hard to write it. The, the, and then we can talk more about just how easy it is to actually publish things. It was almost dangerously easy to publish. You know, when I put the book out, it actually, it, it really wasn't a per- perfect book and it still isn't, you know, every once in a while I'll have someone email me and say, Hey, do you know there's a typo in there? And I'm like, well, that's fine. Whatever. Yeah. 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 You know, so maybe I rushed it a little bit in some ways. So it is very exciting because you can write anything and have it available as a book on Kindle this week. Yeah. And so that's how fast it goes. Well, I mean, so for the guys out there that are actually thinking about writing books, and I know there's a lot of people out there and myself included, actually. So I'm quite interested mm-hmm. to what you, you're going to say about this. Uh, so take us back to when you first decided to write this book, though. I mean, what was the actual thought process that went into getting that first draft completed? I mean, did you spend a lot of time mapping it out? Um, I mean, how long did it actually take you from coming up with the idea to writing your first book to actually completing it and, and start looking at the publishing process? So, yeah, don't don't please do not take this as like a realistic benchmark um, for for how it should be done. In my in my case, it's very unique because so today on Facebook, you know how you have those memories that pop up on Facebook like two years ago or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Today it said it said two years ago today I had posted a static a status on Facebook that said, OK, maybe I'm just manic, but I actually started a book last night and I'm really excited about it. I don't want to talk about it too much. So that was in August. And my first book was actually published. I'm looking at it right now. Um, in September 6th. So, oh, wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. Quick turnaround on that one. And that shows you how fast it can, and this is, it's, it's essentially with a few edits and I, I kind of did a second edition for it, but for the most part, that's the book that's still out there today, you know, and the, this book now is in the top, you know, uh, 
two, 3000 books on Kindle. Mm. So, <laughs> you know, that, that process went by really quick, but the whole conception of it was kind of, um, and she doesn't mind me saying this, but my wife has anxiety and yeah. this came up because she had a, a workbook for anxiety. One of the more popular ones, which is uh, the cognitive behavioral workbook for anxiety. And it's really thick. Like it's like a dictionary. And I opened it up and I was kind of just reading through it. And I was like, what the hell? I have a PhD in this and I, I can barely understand what they're trying to say. Yeah. And so I kind of explained it in my own language instead of saying, you know, you're having these distorted cognitive schemas. I said, well, your brain's being a douche. Right. And it's, this is why. And so she's like, well, you should write a book. I'm like, all right, fine. I will. And so I did it. I'm actually really interested in like how the mind works, social behaviors, um, anything to do with breaking down the psychology of how people approach things, especially sales and everything like that. But I've often ordered books and I've started reading them. And, and like your wife, I've, I've started, I've got like maybe two or three chapters in and gone, I don't, I, don't, I haven't actually understood a word that's been written in this book so far. Mm-hmm. So, and it's clear that these books are different just by the titles. I mean, fuck anxiety and, and, and fuck depression. So <laughs> yeah. have you found that this has bought you like a certain type of clientele and customer? It's been really interesting because it, it has, but it hasn't been the type that I've expected. I think it, what you might expect with the titles and, and kind of the feel of the books is to have a lot of young adult guys. Mm. And that's that's true. There are a lot of young adult guys that are into this, but there's also a ton of, you know, young adult, older adult women. There's a lot of older guys who maybe um, are like veterans of war who just don't like a lot of BS. There's a lot of people who um, even teenagers who are asking their parents to buy this for them. The, The variety of people that have actually been attracted to this are actually pretty broad demographically. Mm. But the kind of unifying theme is that they're They're tired of kind of what you were just talking about, not being able to understand what you're reading and being talked to like you're not equal or something like that. And and that's really what I wanted to get across because at at its core, if you're going to be getting one of my books, you're struggling with something and you're probably out of energy from struggling with that. You're exhausted. Reading takes a lot of effort. So the last thing you need is to be kind of smacked in the face with a dictionary or something like that. (laughs) And so I want to do the opposite. I wanted to make you laugh, lift you up, tell you, I got this. You kind of sit back and just passively take this in and and we'll figure this out. Yeah. I mean, and let's go back to, I mean, you said it took you a month from going from the idea of writing your first book to publishing it. So can you take us through the process you went through in actually writing your first books? I know a lot of people struggle with this. They struggle to, it yeah. sounds ridiculous, even allocate time to do this. So yeah. can you take us through that process? So the, my, my biggest advice for people in writing a book is to just do it. Like when you say you don't have time, that's not true. You know, you, you do have time, but you don't feel like you can use that time effectively. So you're not mm-hmm. doing it. Right. Or you're waiting for the perfect conditions, right? You need to have like the perfect space. You need to have your coffee. You need to have this. You need to have that before you're able to start writing. Mm. And all of those things are untrue. You can write right now if you wanted to, however you'd like. But that doesn't satisfy those criteria that you have in your head about that being the right sort of writing. And so I think that really holds people back a lot. They don't they don't write because they feel like you know, if you wait for the perfect conditions, you're never going to write. And that does happen to a lot of people, right? People fall into that trap. Ten years later, they're still saying, I wish I would have written that book. Yeah. Um, so my biggest advice is, is to just get started, right? And it doesn't have to be perfect when you first go through it, but it just needs to happen. <clears throat> but yeah, there are a lot of barriers to, to people to people not, not being able to do that. And, and a big thing that's really helped me out is just just trying. So if you if you can't write then outline, right? And if you, if you can't outline, then brainstorm, Mm -hmm. just do something. And oftentimes for me, what was really helpful is I I get a couple paragraphs done and something else comes up. I'm very busy, right? So something else comes up or I have to go to sleep or I have to, you know, leave for work or something like that. And instead of just leaving it right there, I'll at least start outlining what I'm going to do when I get back. And that really helped me to have a way to pick it up right when I get back. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And I mean, I mean, did you, because I mean, I find this, I, I, I tend to, when I write even my blog posts, I like to write really detailed blog posts. And most of the time, before I know it, I've crept into the four to 5,000 word mark before I think, right, I should probably try and wrap this up somewhere now. But even during that process, I hit some massive mental blocks sometimes and have to come back to it. I mean, mm-hmm. has this 
I know this is an issue for a lot of people, but has it ever been an issue for you and, and how do you overcome them? Um, you know, I, it, I feel the pull to, towards that. You know, I've, I, so one thing that is really important to not do is every time you get stuck, don't check your phone. And don't check Twitter and don't check Facebook because that's what a lot of people do now. You start writing, then you get writer's block, so you switch tabs. That's like the opposite of what you should do, right? Yeah. Because you're you're derailing yourself even further. You know, the whole idea of like multitasking, really all that means is being very efficient at switching back and forth between things. But the more you force yourself to switch back and forth between things, you know, the harder it's going to be. So you're really shooting yourself in the leg with that. And more than that, you're actually reinforcing yourself for procrastinating, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So that's that's a big thing that I think a lot of people do but don't talk about. And I, I don't know how many people end up doing that, but I'm sure there's a lot of people nodding their heads because that's that's really, I think, as a human in this digital social age, what you're pulled to do. Every time you run into a roadblock, instead of staying with it, you're inclined to switch gears, do something yeah. else, you know, check your stuff. So that's that's a big one there. Um, and the other part is, like I said, you know, you can always take a step back. Like if you run into writer's block, you don't have to keep writing in that narrative form. Maybe you need to outline more, maybe you need to brainstorm more, do something else and then come back to it. Mm. Um, oftentimes fighting the same battle harder isn't the answer. It's maybe taking a slight step to the left or something like that, you know, in the same way that, you know, when you're trying to sleep and you uh, can't sleep and you're just saying, okay, uh, sleep harder, just try harder. That's never going to help. (laughs) Same thing can kind of happen with writer's block where you just try to push yourself through it. Sometimes that doesn't help. Uh, Every once in a while, maybe it does. You just stick with it and it happens, but you there's no rules here. You could do something else too. You can outline, like I said, you could brainstorm, you can write something tangential, but just keep doing it is the thing. Yeah. And do you know, I can actually, you say people are nodding, like you can't see me, but I was actually, I was actually nodding with you there. Like I've done that like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the crux of my books actually. You know, that, that, that is what I wanted people to do. I wanted to be able to have people feel understood and heard. So when I describe things to them, they're like, damn it. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. 100%. And with that, you you trust in what you're reading, and you're more motivated to actually follow through with it because you think this person actually gets it. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Well, you, you're speaking everyone's language, aren't you? You, it, it comes down to, and this is another massive issue I find with people who, when they're starting their own businesses, they they spend so much time on a product or a website or you know the real stuff that doesn't matter in the initial stages. They don't really understand who they're really selling it to or talking to. Right, and I suppose right. if you can talk their language like you do with your book, I mean, even I've come onto your website. The first thing it says is "mental health for real people." That just mm-hmm. hits you in the face and says everything it needs to say in one sentence, right? Right. So, I mean, did you have to spend some time really trying to understand who you are selling to or who you are writing to, or did you always just take it back to the fact that you're writing to people like your wife? Did you use your wife as your avatar? Um, I didn't. I don't want to say I use her as my avatar necessarily. Like this is my, my books are, that's what I sound like in therapy as well. Mm. You know, this is a, a, this is really an extension of my personality. Yeah. Um, but I, the branding for it all came later, actually, you know, the first part, like you said, a lot of people get caught up on that. They want to make the website. They want to have the concept and all this stuff. For me, it was like, I need to, I need to start figuring out what it is that I'm doing first. And that was the writing, the voice, Yes, who who it is I'm talking to, who I could imagine, you know, uh, getting this information and how it might help them. And then the formation of the brand kind of came along. And then from there, when those two pieces clicked into gear, then it was like, oh, now I have a thing. And I was really excited to actually get it done. Yeah. Right. Once I was able to have a mock cover and put that poster up on my wall and, you know, behind my computer, then I'm like, okay, it's go time. Let's do yeah, this. Absolutely. So it does matter, you know, all that extra stuff, the website, the the branding and all of that for sure. But it's definitely not the first step. You know, you got to know that you have a product or something to say. You got to know that you're actually good at saying it, that people care about what you might have to say. You know, for me, I had a built in version of, of validation in that this is what I do for a living already. You know, yeah, other course, people yeah. might not have that. So they need to go through their own processes of trying to trying to validate that or get that sort of uh, reassurance from whatever audience it might be that they have something worthwhile to say. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes, I suppose it goes back to your, your, just, your, your huge experience and your 21 years of being in school and learning this and, and being in that environment. So that must have been a massive, massive help when, when recognizing who you're selling to, I suppose. 
Yeah, you know, it is uh, in some ways yeah. <laughs> because there's also people with PhDs that uh, I don't know who the hell they're writing to. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's a unique combination yeah. in this case. Um, you know, there, there's the, the process was interesting between the two books because they're very different. My second book, the depression one actually took quite a bit longer and it, um, it was harder for me. Um, the first book flew out of me. The second book I had to take actually a lot of proactive steps. Uh, I'm a big gamer, like video gamer. I play a lot of games, uh, you know, online on the computer or PlayStation or whatever. Mm. And, um, I, during the process when I was heavily diving into the writing process for the depression book, I actually, took one day, binged like almost 24 hours straight on gaming and then uninstalled everything for the entire rest of the writing process so that that wasn't there as an extra distraction. Yeah. So that's one other, one of those other ways where, you know, I carved out some extra time. Mm. And, and that's great advice. That's great advice. And um, I mean, I want to, so you, you've, you come up with your idea, you've, you've got the content ready for your first book. What next, what was the next stage for you in terms of, um, approaching the publishing route and, and how did you go into that? Yeah. So I, so my, all my books are published exclusively through Amazon platforms. So that means Kindle for the eBooks. That means, um, they have a company called create space and we can talk more about that for the print book and then audible for the audiobook, which is a Kindle company. Um, and so to start off with, I, man, I, it's hard for me to even take myself back to see how I, how I found out the information about Kindle. I think I probably just Googled like how to self publish a book. <laughs> and that was the first thing yeah. that came up and I'm like, all right, let's do it. Um, but I, I, I decided to start with just a Kindle exclusive book to start with. And that was the most simple thing because essentially you write a word document or a PDF, you upload it, they review it, and then you have a book. Um, and they have all the guidelines on their website for exactly how to format it, what's required and stuff like that. So that was the simplest thing to start out with. And so I did start there. And that process is actually pretty quick. There's a lot of guides that can guide you through it, both, you know, privately, like third parties or through Amazon. Like I said, they have all the requirements and stuff like that. But it doesn't cost you anything. You, you can upload it for free and the, the whole cost of it comes off the back end. And they, you know, they have different options for you for, for whether you stay exclusive with them or whether you're able to do your book in other places. Mm. So this is this kind of actually a big question because a lot of entrepreneurs like to do like bundling, for instance, or include like a, a course with their ebook and different stuff like that. And working with Kindle and Amazon makes it a little more complicated because uh, if you get give Kindle or Amazon, whatever, <laughs> if you give them exclusive rights to, to publish your book, you get 70% of the cut, which is huge yeah. in the yeah, publishing yeah. world. That's massive. If you don't, you know, you're looking more like 30 something percent. It could go lower in some cases. And so there's a big difference there. So if you're going to be going for the non-exclusive, I think you have to be really sure that you're going to have a good reason to like make more money on your own bundling, whatever the case may be mm. for me. I didn't have all that. I had a book that I wanted to publish and I had no reason to, you know, no one's on Nook or any of these other platforms. So I figured let's just do it on Kindle. That's where the people are. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, when you was going through that, public, that, that process of uploading everything to Kindle, getting everything in the Kindle, mm -hmm. on, the, on the other side, in the background, how was you planning on selling this? I mean, who, how are you finding the people you're going to sell to? How are you marketing it? So, uh, my, I actually have, I haven't put a single cent into advertising. Um, it's, it's completely all, you know, bootstrapped and everything like that. Mm. Um, I had an existing audience of, of people that I started with, um, people that, that followed me on various platforms. Um, and I started with them. I, you know, I, I, in every channel that I had started kind of building up the hype about it, talking about it, giving out sample chapters, things like that. Um, and then once it launched, that gave a little bump. And I think that little bump is really important to, to help it um, get some visibility. But the other thing that really helped is uh, if you do have a book that's, that's enrolled in uh, what's called Kindle Unlimited, which is like their, um, you know, you pay a monthly fee and you get free books sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you have it enrolled in that, you can actually do certain deals. And one of the deals is you can offer it for free um, for a while. And so I offered my book for free for whatever period of time they let me. And during that time, I got like a zillion downloads of the book. And what that turns into on the back end, hopefully, and it did in this case, is a lot of reviews afterwards. Yeah. And so giving it for free during that time extended it way beyond my own personal reach through my networks and stuff like that. And that really kind of got the ball rolling. Um, 
one downside to, to Amazon platforms is they don't have very good analytics. So I don't know where these people are coming from. <laughs> okay, well, I can't really, I can't really <laughs> track it very well. You know, I know how much I've sold. I know in which countries generally I've sold them in, but that's about it. So it's a little bit of a mystery in some ways of, of where everyone's coming from. Like I said, it's definitely beyond my personal network at this point. It started snowballing and I, and, um, one thing that also helped was after I did the ebook doing the other versions, the audiobook, the print book, for some reason within the Amazon platform, they really like that. And that when you get all three, the kind of trifecta, it bumps up your search results within Amazon. Um, okay. it's not, I, I don't have a, a lot of data to back that up except that it happened with both of my books and it helped a lot. So like if you, for instance, you know, my book was doing fine, but once I got all three of those versions out, now when you go to Amazon and you just go in the plain Amazon search and you put anxiety in, my book's the first thing that pops up. And that happened after I got all of those. Okay. That's, that's interesting, yeah. actually, isn't it? That, yeah, that is interesting, actually. I, I didn't think that that would work that way in Amazon. I, but, okay, so you've gone through the Kindle, and it sounds relatively mm-hmm. simple, actually, going through the Kindle route. How it is. They have, they have all the tools you need. Just they, they, have a, they have a preview thing, so you can make sure that it looks good, like a virtual preview. Mm-hmm. Um, you can look at it on all the different devices that it might be viewed on and stuff like that. So you can be really assured that of what it's going to look like on the other side when people actually download it. Yeah. The hard part is just pressing the button to say, okay, here it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's, it's out in the world now. Yep. Um, so how does that process change then when it comes to uh, publishing for a paperback book and then also after that into the audio book too? Mm-hmm. So the um, the print book process is is really the one of the coolest things about the whole self-publishing game right now. And that's because... Um, there are a variety of different avenues to go through. Like I said, I use create space, which is the Amazon company and it's, it's a print on demand company. So I actually don't hold any inventory of my books. That's a really hard part for, for people who create products, especially books is the idea of, okay, how many of these do I have to buy? What can I sell them for? Et cetera. In this way, anyone from pretty much anywhere in the world can go buy my book and somewhere in a factory out there, it gets printed on demand and sent straight to them which is pretty awesome. So it, it costs no money on your end. Again, it's just like the Kindle thing where they take a percentage off the back end of it. Mm. Um, but the process for publishing it is, is pretty similar. You know, you take your, you take your um, Kindle manuscript that you made, you decide what size book you want, and then you adapt it to that. They have guides through all this. You can even pay somebody at CreateSpace to help you through the process if you'd like. But again, they have very clear guides for all of this. You have to change your cover to make sure it's a wraparound cover. Um, and then you kind of decide all, this, all the specifics, like do you want it to be in color or black and white? Do you want the cover to be glossy or matte? You just click all those options, and then you upload it the same way. That, do you know what? That, it's incredible, isn't it? That sounds, that sounds it sounds amazing. It sounds stupid simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sounds amazing. It really is easy. You know, and, and, and here's the thing. It, it's easy, which is a... A plus and a minus. It's a plus because if you have a good idea, if you have something that's going to resonate with people, the tools are there and it's amazing. On the bad side of it, it's really bloated because a lot of people don't have something good to say and it's so easy to get it out there, right? Yeah. Everyone has yeah. a microphone. And so a lot of people are saying a lot of stupid stuff with those microphones. Um, there's a lot of bad books out there. You know, if you ever go to the Kindle forums, like the Kindle publisher forums, it's a really, it's a really uh, painful place. You know, it's somebody, you know, a, a, 52 year old who's like, I wrote this sci-fi about cats time traveling. And for some reason it's not selling. What am I doing wrong? (laughs) You know? (laughs) And so there's a lot of that out there, but you know, like I said, it's a plus and minus. You can race through, you can kind of uh, race through those ranks really easily Mm -hmm. if you have something good to say, but there is a lot out there as well. Okay, and then let's move on to uh, the last uh, format of, of, of books, which is audio books. I mean, how did you go mm-hmm. down that route, and how is that different from the ebook and the paperback book? Um, yeah, the, so the audio book, it's, it's through Audible. So they have a program called, um, it's ACX, I think, Aud- Audible Creator Exchange or something to that effect. And it's a really interesting sort of marketplace. So you can either sign up as an um, author or as a narrator, or both. And um, you can give your book to people to narrate for you. So you can pay people within the program to narrate it for you. Or you can narrate your own book or narrate other other people's books. So it's an interesting sort of marketplace. Um, For me, it was really important to narrate my own book. And this is only really advisable if you have the know-how, the technology and stuff like that to do it. 
Um, I have, you know, kind of a history in, in podcasting and other sort of, you know, multimedia attempts in my past. So I had, you know, a decent, decent enough microphone. And what I actually did is I, I converted a, a walk-in closet into like a recording space. Wow. Um, so, so my, my, um, my most recent book that I, or the most recent project that I did was the audio book for my depression book. And, um, I literally was like, okay, I'm going to do this now. So I, I have a good microphone. I put it into the, into the walk-in closet. I went to the hardware store and bought thick moving blankets and hung them up on the walls for soundproofing and put some command hooks on the wall and put this, the iPad in there so that I can look at the iPad and read while I was you know talking into the microphone. And that was that. <laughs> And do you know that's, that's that's awesome. I love that. And I've I've also seen guys do crazy things like I don't know if it works. I'm not I'm not a, a guru when it comes to soundproofing rooms by any means. Mm-hmm. But even putting things like empty egg cartons on the wall and things the like egg that. Curtains are actually it depends what material. Most of them actually are not good because they block out a like a actually. There's a lot of YouTube videos about you know good sort of home soundproofing uh, yeah. for for cheap. The egg crates usually block out the wrong sort of frequency, so it doesn't make your voice sound very good. Um, the moving blankets did okay. You know, just having a separate space of any kind is helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I recorded it. Um, I recorded both audiobooks on my own. Um, the second one is decidedly better than the first one. I need to re-record the first one because I have better quality now. I actually think I think you and I both have the same microphone. I'm looking at your thumbnail, do you have the uh, the Rode Procaster? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. It's such a good mic. It's a great mic. Uh, I think it was what like three hundred bucks or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I think about hundred and fifty pounds. I think I paid for it. Okay, yeah. Uh, exactly. So, um, yeah, you know, good mic like that. But the first one that I did, I actually. I think my first audio book I did with um, a cheap blue snowball mic, which is actually quite inexpensive, quite accessible. It's a USB mic. And what I did was I just got a long cord for it so I can get away from my computer hum into a different room and recorded it that way. Mm. And so that worked out pretty well. And um, it, it's a it's a simple process that there are sticklers on the type of um, like – the formatting and stuff like that, you need to make sure you have the right file types. You need to make sure you have the right amount of dead space before, you know, the narration so that they can use their own compression software. If they, if you do anything wrong, they'll send it back to you and make you redo it. So there's a little bit of back and forth sometimes. Um, and if, like I said, if you don't have a background in, in audio, it might not be the route for you. Mm. For me, it was very important because I wanted them to be in my voice because as I'm writing, I really narrate this in my head and it's, it's my jokes, it's my voice and I couldn't have anybody else do yeah. it. So it had to be me in this case. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the beautiful thing about audio books actually, because I mean, I think even one I, I listened to was Gary Vaynerchuk's one and he oh, adds yeah. stuff to the book that's not in the book. He says, I want to add something to this now, which is just great mm. because it, it just gives so much more depth to the content and it, it makes it so much more relevant because he's, he's, he's doing it on the fly at the time, which is, which is incredible. I mean, yeah, yeah. Pat Flynn did that too with, yeah. uh, his, his, with, uh, will it fly? I actually just listened to that audio book and, um, yeah, he says, I'm going to go out the script here for a minute and talk about this. And he's okay. All right, let's go back to the script, yeah. you know? And it is, it makes it feel a lot more real. Yeah. I've actually just ordered Pat Flynn's book and I'm looking forward to reading that one. It literally turned off my doorstep yesterday. So I'm that's awesome. To, yeah. it, it's fantastic. I really, really highly recommend it. Um, I mean, Jeff Bezos has got this down right. He's made this so simple for people at Amazon to, to, to publish books across any format. I mean, what's the quality control like in terms of getting something through Amazon onto its screen? You said there's a lot of bad books out there, but mm, yeah, do they screen uh, you that much when you actually go through? And, and is there a lot of back and forth when you're trying to publish your, your content? There's actually not. Um, the basically the screening they do for publishing a Kindle book is more to make sure that your content actually fits with what you described. So you don't say I'm writing a children's book and it turns out to actually be porn or something like that, right? And so they want to <laughs> yeah, make sure it's consistent. Yeah. They want to make sure it doesn't violate any of the the terms. I mean, it's pretty liberal because you can you can do everything from like I said a children's book to an action novel to erotica. You can do a lot of different things on on Amazon. So they're not really worried too much about the content as long as it's not like um, anything that's illegal or anything that's like, you know, really defaming or things like that. So the, the screening is basically just a really basic quality assurance, but not actually judging your content or anything like that. Um, I'm sure if you, if it didn't make any sense or if there was no format to it and they could tell it was just like spam or something, they might screen that out. But in terms of, you know, your book not being good, you know, like objective, like a subjectively good, they're not going to screen it out for that. I don't think. Okay, well, I mean, it's 
it's, you've got a ton of knowledge when it comes to books. I'm sure the listeners are going to get a lot from everything you've gone through there. But you've also got a lot of other stuff, other stuff going on as well. I mean, you've got you talked about your other book there, your your book, you've, mm-hmm. um, the um, Fuck Depression book, the Hardcore right. Self Help Fuck Depression mm-hmm. book. You said that was different from your first book, and it, and it presented a few more challenges. In tell us a bit more about the book and, and how is it so different from the first book. Yeah, so I, this is actually interesting uh, because I the, the book has done great. It's not doing anywhere near what the first book has done, though. It, it's doing very well, but the first book has been kind of like meteoric, just like out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is because I didn't really do a strong validation process. The first one, I, I, I lucked out because... I, I just knew that it was I was onto something, and that one was about anxiety. This one's about depression, and I don't know how familiar you are with kind of the two different terms, but somebody who's anxious, if you kind of picture that sort of person, they're the type of person to want to really get rid of that quickly. Like, what can I do? I'm going to do anything. I'm going to buy everything under the sun. I probably won't use any of it, but I'm really just ah, I'm worked up. I want to do something about it. Mm. Somebody who's depressed is like, man, I don't deserve to get better. Like, I'm not going to do shit about it. I don't care. (laughs) Right. And so uh, that, that made me realize that there's probably just a built in big difference about how many people can actually utilize this thing. So that was one thing that, that I've come up against is in this second book, I, um, I could have done a little bit more validating on that end. Uh, however, I do think it's important for it to be out because the people that do encounter it, it really helps them out. But what that has led me to is the audiobook for this, for this depression book. And um, the reason being is that it's a lot easier to hear somebody read to you than reading. Like if you've ever been depressed or if you've ever been super stressed out, the last thing you want to do usually is read because that takes so much effort. And so in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'll read it for you. How about that? You know, I'll just give you the information. You could sit back and take it. Mm. And it seems to be proving true actually, because the audiobook is selling really well so far. I mean, it's, this is the first full month that it's been out and it's, it's doing great. So um, that, that's how it's been different in terms of the re, the reception and kind of the follow through of the user base. Yeah. Um, but the writing process was different too. This book is, uh, like I said, it's twice as long and it's, I learned a lot from just going through this whole first process of my first book, both in my own writing style, my processes and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to make a book that had the same flavor, but was mature, more mature in every way, you know, so a little more fleshed out, a little more helpful if I could be a little more detailed and stuff like that. So it ended up being twice as long. It's still a short read, but um, it took me longer and I, I was more intentional about it. I used more strategies like outlining, being, you know, more intentional with my time, scheduling things out, quitting gaming. Like I said, yeah. you know, uh, the first book like flew out of me. I couldn't even control it. This book was more of a conscious process for sure. Right. Okay. And I mean, you, you touched on there that, I mean, it's interesting actually, isn't it? That people would, it makes sense when you think about it, that people were consuming this book over a uh, audio format rather than, than paperback. Yeah. So what have you seen though, in terms of your sales? I mean, across both your books, what generally seems to be the best seller when it comes to either Kindle paperback or, or an audio book? Um, yeah, I mean, I, the, what surprised me was the, was the paperback. I thought when I did the paperback books, people weren't going to really care, you know, but, um, because, you know, when you think about it, we're, we're moving away from paperback just generally in the world. But, it actually really wasn't true. And the interesting thing was that when I released my paperback book, it increased the sales of the Kindle book as well. So they both went up, okay. which I didn't expect, but um, it, it did happen that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I consistently sell, uh, you know, around a thousand paper books a month That's awesome. um, and then like 20 to 30 Kindle books a day. Um, so they're, they're selling quite a bit. And by far, the anxiety book sells a whole lot more. Um, probably like tenfold. Um, but the depression book, uh, makes more money per book. So it actually kind of evens out pretty well because the, uh, the price point on the, on the, the, uh, anxiety Kindle book is like two 99. Um, so it's really low and the three 99 is the, is for the depression book. And, you know, I kind of jumped up the price for the paperback and then audible, one point that I didn't mention for Audible is they actually decide the price for you. It's just purely based on length. So you don't have any control of that. For all the other ones, you do have control of the price. All right. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I didn't realize that either. That's um, that's interesting, actually. I didn't either until I did this last one. I had a, I had a, like a, a, a price in mind. And I'm like, where can I change this? And then yeah. I'm like, oh, I actually can't. They just straight up, you know, they charge based on length. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, and congratulations, by the way, on, on, on the sales you're hitting as well. That's awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been, it's, it's, it's changed the course of, of my life, honestly. Like, um, uh, during when I wrote the first book, when I wrote the anxiety book, you know, like I said, the, the whole early career pre-doc post-doc psychology thing is not usually a fun time. You're supposed to be struggling and I'm married. I have a kid now that happened during this process, you know, and I didn't want to be doing that. But at that time, you know, we were in a place where, you know, rent was not a foregone conclusion every month, (laughs) you know, and you know, there was, there was times where, you know, my dog got sick and I had to borrow money from people to, to, to pay for that. So we weren't exactly lush. And now, um, I, that's not, that's not the case. You know, I, I, I never have to worry about that. You know, yeah. I, in some ways, the first month that my book automatically paid for my rent, I was like, holy crap, this is something different. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> awesome. yeah, so it's really changed a lot. Um, I mean, and you've got other stuff going on as well. I mean, you're extremely busy. Yeah. I don't know how you manage it all to <laughs> you, but I mean, can you tell us more about your podcast as well? Yeah. So, so what happened was when I, I started writing these books and um, the cool thing about, about, digital media and, and just self-publishing is you could be so transparent. You know, I told people in the book, like, Hey, if you have extra, extra thoughts, or you want to give me feedback, email me at this address, stuff like that. So people started emailing me and they started asking a lot of questions. And, you know, throughout my uh, kind of social media career, I've always gotten questions from people. And as a psychologist, you have to be careful about who you answer and what answers you give, because you don't have a formal sort of care relationship with them. Mm. So instead, what I decided to do was instead of kind of responding to every single person, giving them all the advice that may or may not be perfectly legal to do, I decided to start a podcast where I can address their concerns more generally. So my podcast, it's called the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. And basically, I take uh, question and answer questions about mental health, psychology, relationships, life, whatever. And then I occasionally also do interviews with people who that who I find very interesting or inspirational. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah that that's going great too. And and um, to start you know the first episode to start off with I I didn't have a lot of I didn't have questions like in the bank so I stole questions from Reddit because there's a bunch of you know subreddits for anxiety for depression self help and stuff like that so I just stole questions from there. But now I don't have that problem. Now I have the opposite problem where I need to really pick and choose which which questions make mm-hmm. a good episode. Yeah. That sounds awesome. It sounds really good. And like always, guys, I mean, Robert's got a lot of stuff going on here. So in the show notes, I'll put links to all of his books, his podcasts and everything else. Um, Robert, I mean, it, <laughs> there are anything else going on at the minute? I mean, what's, what's coming up <laughs> in the future for you? <laughs> Man, I, you know, it, it's so funny because all this is in the foreground, in the background. It's like I just, you know, a couple of weeks ago took my my huge four hour licensing exam for psychology, you know, and I'm <laughs> yeah. like I'm doing all of that stuff, too. So that's that's the other thing that's going on. Um I'm I'm currently kind of in the in the very early stages of doing another book, which is a collaboration. It's going to be a book about actually about like dementia and, and aging issues It written in a similar vein, but a little less aggressive. So it's going to be more like Hey, you know, you're getting this book because you're worried about your parent. Let's let's be straightforward about what this is, what it, it's what it's not, and and really guiding people through that process. Mm. But um, you know, there's no timeline on that yet. That's kind of uh, very casually in the, in the starting phases. Yeah. But mostly, what I'm doing right now is I just put out, like I said, that audio book for for my depression book, and that's um, that's been my most recent project. And then weekly doing the podcast. Oh, awesome, man! Awesome, and I mean, if you send if your books going to be anything like your previous books i've got no doubt it's gonna it's gonna be a hit so good luck with everything that's coming up and especially all your exams in the background and everything <laughs> else i mean thank you um and i mean we, we've run out of time here robert but it's been a great oh, interview yeah. so thank you for coming on um before we go have you got any final parting words of wisdom for the listeners of the show yeah for one um please feel free to email me or or tweet me so my my twitter handle is duff the psych and you can email me at duffthepsych at gmail.com. If you have any extra questions, I know it's hard to get through all this in one hour. And, you know, I, I probably skipped over a lot of details. But if you have any extra questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them um, related to publishing and stuff like that. And like I said, at, at the beginning, the, the main thing that I think is important when you're thinking about self-publishing is just to do the damn thing, right? Don't make a lot of excuses for yourself. Realize that when you say you have no time, that probably literally isn't true. It just means that your time isn't 
isn't functioning in the way that you want it to. And so I, you know, I had some tips in there for that, but, but, but just be really honest with yourself about that. And it doesn't have to be perfect. You just need to start the process and get the thing done. Yeah. All right. Take action. Get it out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, Robert, that was an incredible interview. Thank you very much for coming on today. Guys, Robert did mention his uh, contact details there. So like always, they'll be in the show notes below and you can hit him up on there. I recommend checking out his books, his podcast, and hitting him up on his contact details and getting in touch. Robert, thank you so much for coming on today. That was incredible. My pleasure. Okay, guys, and there it is. Robert, thank you so much for coming on the show today. You have given me the kick I need to get on with my book. I mean, I've been thinking about writing a book for a while now, and I don't know why I haven't, actually. Whenever I decide to do something, generally, I just throw myself into it 110%. But with this book, I've been a little bit hesitant, to be fair. And I don't, like I said, I'm not sure why. So, Robert, I mean, thank you, because you've given me that kick just to get it done. I mean, it's just that get stuff done attitude and I love it. So I'm actually going to start my book. I think I'm going to get into mine now. I've already outlined what I want in my book. I've sort of really, I've put down on paper in loose note form what I'd like to write about. But I think now, or I say I think, there's no thing about it. I'm now going to actually jump into this and and start it and just see what comes with it. Because writing a book is something that excites me. And I know I've got a lot going on in my head. I mean, I've probably lose track of half my thoughts, but I've got so much going on in my head. And since I've been working a lot with um, a lot of clients offline, privately as well, like one-to-one as well as online, I have answered a lot of questions people are having. And these questions, they're not all the same, but they're very similar. So I think if I can put this into a, a format where it's all in one place, where I'm answering everyone's question in one place, then that surely could be a good thing. So I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to start writing my book. So Robert, thank you very much. Now, we've also got another very exciting project going on, guys. I've been working with Greg Isaacs from Higher Performance Performance One Program, the Higher Performance One Program. And for those who don't know, Greg is an inspirational speaker, a transformational speaker, and he's been working with guys for the last 20 years. He's been working with people, helping them make effective changes in their lives to literally help them excel, whether it's sports, fitness, business, or life. And we've combined the High Performance One program. So it's got the mindset maintenance, okay, getting you mentally in a state where you're ready to excel and succeed. And then once we've got you there and you're ready to go and you're literally chomping at the bit to get out there and, and, and start making a success of yourself, we've got the foundations in place where if you follow our blueprints, guys, you can set up and run a successful business, whether it's online or offline. So we've brought this together now, this whole program together. We've got a great team in place that's already helping people in the UK set up their dreams okay set up their dream jobs set up their dreams businesses and it's through seminars through online programs which we're just developing and we're also in the process of setting up um, an audio course guys we've just done the first recording the first four or five hours recording we've got another two or three sessions to go so we're going to have hours and hours of content there to start going through and putting an audio course together as well and we're also going to publish that in a book too so why we're on to books as well there's going to be a book for that as well um, and that is it guys so if you are interested in anything Robert spoke about any of his links any of his podcasts his books everything will be in the show notes below also guys check out the high performance one program okay that program is going to have everything in it that entrepreneurs are crying out for and I know they're crying out for it because I'm listening and I'm in this environment I'm speaking to people all the time and this is stuff people need so if you do feel you could benefit from a program like the high performance one Check out the link below, get onto the mailing list, you'll be the first to know when that audio course is live and also when we've got upcoming dates for our seminars. We've already got our first one launching on the 29th of October of this month, we've had a huge interest for that which is just incredible, so we're looking forward to that and that is it guys, okay? A lot going on, but thank you for tuning in once again, it has been an absolute pleasure bringing the show to you today and I'll see you next time for the MyCoder podcast. (laughs) 